All right. So starting out with Kepler's laws. So Kepler had three laws. Kepler was um, doing astronomy in the, I want to say 1600s and um, using the data gathered by Tycho Brahe, um, which who is a very interesting and strange person in astronomy history. Um, and what Kepler was able to do was tie together all of the observations of the orbits of the planets into a set of three laws to describe their motion completely. So the first of his three laws is that the planets orbit the sun in ellipses. Um, and there are two fo foci of an ellipse. Their star is at one of those, so at one focus. The same orbital pattern isn't just for planets around stars. It also holds for moons around their planets, for comets and asteroids around the sun, and basically any other objects in orbit where there's one object orbiting a larger object, or a more massive one, I would say. Um, so when we look at an ellipse, like I said, there are two foci. And for planets in orbit, the sun is at one focus, and the planet is orbiting around the sun. And when we look at the distance of that planet to the sun, we'll notice that in an elliptical orbit, that means that the planet is actually at different distances at different times in its orbit, right? So how can we characterize the sort of distance to the star when it's always changing? Um, what we do is use what's called the semi-major axis, which is the average distance to what is being orbited around. So um, I'm not going to go into too much more detail about this, except to say that the semi-major axis um, can be measured for all the planets. That's what Kepler did and put all of this together into um, his first, second, and third laws. Okay, and again, this doesn't have to be a sun and a planet. It could also be a planet and a moon, for example. In that case, the planet would lie at one focus and the moon would be the object orbiting around. All right, so there's, you know, in the case of a star and a planet, there's a star at one focus. Um, what's at the other focus? All right, so I see the most answers for B, that there's nothing special at that other focus. Um, it's not a Lagrangian point. We're not going to get into those, but if you're curious, you can ask me after class. So there's nothing really special about this other focus. It just so happens that this is, you know, another mathematically interesting point of the ellipse. Um, but for the purposes of understanding the orbits, all you need to know is that there's a massive object at the focus, a second massive object orbiting around the first one, and the average distance is called the semi-major axis. All right, so um, circular orbits are actually more familiar, at least from the physics perspective. And a circle is just a special type of ellipse. If we bring the foci closer and closer together until they completely overlap, then the eccentricity, the amount of kind of squashedness of that ellipse goes from being very large to being um, not squashed at all. So a circle is an ellipse, um, with a special eccentricity. And I can't remember the equation for eccentricity off the top of my head, but I think the circle has eccentricity zero and a line has eccentricity one being maximally squished. All right, so the foci overlap in a circular ellipse. And let's say that you are looking at this circular ellipse. Um, what would you call the semi-major axis in this case? All right, I see everyone voting for C. That's the radius of the circle. That's exactly right. So in this case, this, this is why I say it's more, you know, a more familiar type of orbit to us. And in fact, um, a lot of the elliptical orbits for the planet in our planets in our solar system are close to being circular. The, um, the orbits are not very eccentric. And so there's not a huge amount of difference between our point of closest approach and our, our point of farthest you know, distance from the sun. Um, but some planets like Mercury have more eccentric orbits, more squashed. All right, so Kepler's second law just describes, you know, beyond just the shape described by the first law, how 
a planet moves in that orbit. So let's say that there's a line between the planet and the star, and we're going to let the planet orbit and sweep out some area in a given time. Um, if we look at, I guess I have my arrows backwards here. If we look at going from December 1st through the month of December and then through the month of January, so a two month um, time span, um, that's actually when planet Earth is closest to the sun, is during those winter months. And so it will sweep out this area. If we drew a line between the planet at, I, at both of those times and just color it in, that's what I mean by some area. And if I look at what happens in the summer months when the Earth is farthest from the sun, then I sweep out the same two months of time and that covers a much smaller distance on my ellipse, but it sweeps out an equal area. So this principle of equal areas um, holds true for any objects in an elliptical orbit. So those two regions are the same area. If you, you know, counted up the pixels of color in each one, you'd find that they were the same. Um, and I guess just to comment on this a little bit, what it means is that planets are moving really fast at this point of closest approach because they have a longer arc to cover in the same amount of time. And planets are moving much slower where they have a short arc to cover in the summer months here. So the speed of an object in orbit is not constant. Okay, so because the speed is not constant, we have to use some other metric to tell us about the time that it takes to go around. Um, so instead of using speed, we typically discuss the orbital period. And that's just the time that it, an object takes to make one full orbit. And so that's um, letter P here. And then A is our semi-major axis. And so um, Kepler's third law ties those two quantities together in this relationship that the orbital period squared is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed. So this is a, you know, a key relationship. It holds true for all the planets. Um, and this, the constant of proportionality, we'll get to that in a little while. All right, so we could look at this graphically if we decide to plot the semi-major axis against the period, um, we're gonna take a really solar system centric approach and measure the semi-major axis in units of AU. That's the distance, average distance between the sun and the earth. And then the period we're going to take again, a earth centric attitude and measure that in years. And so when we plot all of the planets and the asteroids, well, some large asteroids at least in our solar system, um, we can see that they all fall along this theoretical curve described by this equation. So Kepler's third law holds. Okay, so just a conceptual question, maybe using this graph, how does the speed of objects far from the sun compare to objects close to the sun? All right, I see most votes for B, that the farther the planet is, the slower a speed it has. And um, the way that we can get this from this graph is that if an object way up here, for example, has a period of five and a half years, that's a very long time that it takes to orbit. So it's going very slowly. Um, I guess it's not totally fair to ask for slower speed, but I guess what I meant was slower angular speed. Anyway, if you're, you know, if you're gonna complain at me about the physics, that's fine. Okay, so the orbital time grows faster than the orbital size. That's what we can see here from this graph. As we get farther and farther from the sun, the orbital time gets larger, faster. So all these asteroids are moving more slowly around the sun than the planets are. All right, so Kepler's third law, again, the orbital period squared is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed meaning that um, objects with a longer semi-major axis have a slower orbital velocity. And um, this equation, well, is exact as long as you're measuring the period in years and the semi-major axis in AU. All right, so for our planets in the solar system, that's what makes this equation exact. All right, so, um, this brings us to the idea of a rotation curve. 
this is a little bit different than what we were looking at in the last um, plot because we're looking now at the orbital velocity in units of kilometers per second, right? So this way we can, you know, fairly compare this, the actual speed of these objects. So when we plot the speed, then we see that Mercury has the largest speed in our solar system, and that's dropping off slower and slower as we go to farther and farther distances um, out to Neptune and then Pluto and Eris. So this rotation curve um, where you have a falling speed for increasing distance, this is a consequence of Kepler's third law. This is just the physics. <laughs>